This morning uh, we are continuing in Mark's gospel and we're going to be looking at uh, the section I already told you about that has to do with the prayer of our Lord in the garden prior to his betrayal by Judas, which we will look at, so, well, uh, considering whether, well, if, if we don't delve into another topic that's in this text. But um, let's begin by reading this particular passage, beginning in verse 32 of Mark 14 uh, through verse 42. This is what uh, Mark records. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, as you know, we're coming to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus would spend his last few hours, we might say, of freedom uh, in prayer before he would be crucified to save his people, to save us if we're trusting him. Now, one thing I'm very tempted to look at, and I, I think uh, still may want to do something you know, in this area, is, is the idea of prayer, because this passage certainly speaks to us about just how important prayer really is Jesus was about to face what we would say is arguably his most difficult trial. He was about to face his father's wrath for our sins, and he needed his father's help to be able to make it through this, and so he prayed. Now, as you know, Jesus is our example in everything. We are to follow that example. Jesus prayed, and so we should pray just on, on that account, but we need to ask this question too. If Jesus, you know, God in human flesh, needed to pray in order to face the difficulties that he was facing, how much more do we need to pray? Now, we also have another example in this text, and that is the example of the disciples. And I think it shows us something about how difficult it is for us to pray. Now, because of the difficulty that Jesus was about to face, he asked his disciples to join him, I think all of them, but particularly Peter, James, and John, we might say the inner circle. Jesus did have, as it were, his closest apostles. But I think we see in them something that we often face when we're trying to pray. They also lost sight of just how important prayer really is. And we see in us, I think sometimes, I mean literally, if you've been to our prayer meetings, you may have seen one or two of us nodding off while we're praying. I think we're tempted to do the same thing that they are, sort of falling asleep at the wheel of prayer when we should be seeking the Lord earnestly. We're either tempted to do that or we're tempted to neglect it altogether and just not come. So let's be encouraged by the example of Jesus Christ as well as the negative example of the apostles we see here to take this means of grace more seriously, you know, to do what the Lord calls us to do, which is to meet together and pray, to pray uh, you know, personally or individually, and pray in our families, pray as individuals, pray as a church, to pray without ceasing, the Lord tells us. And again, I don't think he means by that to be praying all day, every day, and everything you're doing, although it's certainly not a bad idea uh, 
I think we should be practicing, as it were, the presence of God to know that He is always with us, to be doing those things that we know would be pleasing to Him because He always sees what we're doing. Certainly we should be doing that, but I think what He has in mind here is we ought to be seeking those things that God calls us to seek. And we ought to keep on seeking those things until we actually receive those things. We need to pray in that sense without ceasing. But what I would like us to focus on this morning particularly is Jesus' prayer, because I think it reveals to us something of the importance of His work, especially for us. Because, again, it tells us that as He's praying, if it's possible, let this hour pass by. The fact that it didn't pass by meant that this was the only way that salvation could come. Jesus is basically asking His Father, if you can save your people any other way, and those were Jesus' people as well, then let this cup I'm about to drink pass from me. But the fact that the Father didn't allow it to pass means that He couldn't allow it to pass. This was the only way that He could bring salvation to His people. If He was going to save anyone, it had to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. If it wasn't, it would be infinitely cruel on the part of the Father to put His Son through this if we could come in any other way. So this morning I want us to consider two things. First of all, the fact that Jesus had to die in order to save you, that this was the only way. And then I want us to, to look just for a few moments at why it had to come this way, why it had to be Jesus who had to die in order to save us. So first of all, Jesus had to die in order to save you. Now, why do we know this is true? Well, again, because of the answer the Father gave to the prayer that Jesus prayed, Jesus asked if this hour might pass, if he might not drink the cup, then let it pass. But that hour didn't pass, and he had to drink that cup. Now, again, we have to ask the question, would the Father have put his son through this through what Jesus had to suffer if salvation could have come in any other way? Now, I think to answer that question, we have to understand a little bit more about what it is that the Father actually did put His Son through. That's something we really have very little appreciation for because we've never gone through that. But I do think we have something, we get a sight of that in the garden. Now, you do understand that in order to save you, that the Father had to lay your guilt upon Jesus Christ, the guilt of all of His people, the guilt of everyone who would ever trust in the Lord Jesus Christ was laid on His Son. And that would include, of course, the guilt of every single sin that you have ever committed, that I've ever committed, and ever will commit. And then the Father had to punish Jesus justly for those sins. In other words, He had to pour His wrath out on Him on the cross for every single one of those things. Jesus, we believe, literally had to experience hell on the cross. That hell, of course, which you and I would have had to experience for all eternity. He had to go through it on the cross during that period of time in order to save you from your sins. Now again, how can we even imagine what, what that is like to experience God's full wrath. I mean, we don't know what crucifixion is like, but that's often what, what is in view in, in a number of churches as they consider it the sufferings of Jesus. They're looking just at the physical suffering on the cross, but there was much more than that. So how can we gain some insight into that? How can we know what that's like? Well, we really can't do very much except read what the Scripture tells us, but I do think we do gain a little bit of insight here when we consider what Jesus was going through while he was praying. Now, we've already seen in Mark's gospel that Jesus told his disciples, my soul is grieved to the point of death. Again, as he's considering what it is he's about to go through, it brought this tremendous grief. But Luke tells us a little bit more. And so let, let's read that now. Luke 22, verses 41 through 44. Luke says, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. 
yet not my will but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now that has been understood as we look at the language and as we understand a number of interpreters who have looked at this as well. It's not saying that his sweat was like drops of blood, but he was bleeding like he was sweating. He was literally sweating blood. Now it is interesting that Luke, of, of all the writers of the Gospels, and you know there are four of them, Luke is the only one who actually records that this took place. Maybe it's because Luke was a doctor and he took note of these particular things. But we also know this, that people usually don't sweat blood unless there's something seriously wrong with you. I suppose if you have like Ebola virus, you might do something like that. But people usually don't sweat blood and people who have done this, if they're not, of course, sick, have done so only under the greatest duress. This tells us something about what Jesus was about to face. Now, Jonathan Edwards, as you know, has a way of bringing these things out fairly uh, poignantly, so I thought I would give you a quote from his sermon, which I would recommend to you, entitled, Christ's Agony. This is what he writes about this event. If the suffering of Christ had occasioned merely a violent sweat, it would have shown that he was in great agony, for it must be an extraordinary grief and exercise of mind that causes the body to be all of a sweat abroad in the open air in a cold night, as that was, as is evident from John 18:18. 18, 18, quote, and the servants and officers stood there who had made a coal of fires, or excuse me, a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself, close quote. This was the same night in which Christ had his agony in the garden. But Christ's inward distress and grief was not merely such as caused him to be in a violent and universal sweat, but such as caused him to sweat blood. The distress and anguish of his mind was so unspeakably extreme as to force his blood through the pores of his skin and that so plentifully as to fall in great clots or drops from his body to the ground. Now, we do need to ask ourselves the question, what is it that Jesus was actually thinking about? What was it that he was looking at that caused him to sweat blood? Well, the answer to that question could only be one thing. The Father must have shown him what it was that he was about to go through what was in the cup that the Father was giving him to drink so that he might, as it were, take it willingly and not simply go into it blindfolded. Well, what Jesus saw grieved him to the point of death. What he saw made him sweat blood. And what he saw must have been more than just the mocking that he was going to have to endure or the beating by the soldiers or the scourging or even the crucifixion because he wasn't the only one who went through these things. You know, the other two who were crucified with him had to endure something very similar, but we don't read about them sweating blood. Jesus saw more than that. Jesus was looking, as it were, into the fiery oven of God's wrath, what it was he was going to have to endure on the cross. And again, the Father wanted him to see that so that he might know the choice that he had to make, because Jesus did have a choice, whether to submit to his Father's will or not. Now, we know, of course, that Jesus, in his, because of his nature, was going to choose that, but there was still a choice that was here. He had to be presented with this choice, and he had to make it willingly in order to make this payment. Again, Edwards writes this, Christ was going to be cast into a dreadful furnace of wrath, and it was not proper that he should plunge himself into it blindfold as not knowing how dreadful the furnace was. Therefore, that he might not do so, God first brought him and set him at the mouth of the furnace so that he might look in and stand and view its fierce and raging flames and might see where he was going and might voluntarily enter into it and bear it for sinners as knowing what it was. This view Christ had in his agony. Now it is true that Jesus, seeing what was in front of him, did pray that this cup might pass away from him. 
But seeing that the answer was that this cup could not pass, and knowing what it would cost him, he prayed for the grace to drink that cup. And you know he did drink it. Edwards makes an interesting comment. He says that all of this happened while Jesus was still a free man. Before Judas came with the soldiers, while he still had time to escape, the fact that he stayed there and that he gave himself willingly to betrayal and to arrest means that he gave himself willingly to suffer God's wrath for you in order that you might be saved. Now again, the question, do you think the father would have put his son through this kind of agony, the very sight of which caused him to sweat blood, if there was any other way that you could be saved? If he was intending to do what many people think, even Christians, sadly, or at least professing Christians, think that God's going to do, ultimately forgive everyone. I'm not, you know, I'm, everybody's going to go to heaven. I can't stand the sight of anybody suffering in hell, so I'm going to bring you all to heaven. Or if you could get there by your own works, your own righteousness, by cleaning up your own act and sort of doing the right things, or if you could come through other religions that have nothing to do with, with God, that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, that worship false gods and first way, you know, false ways of salvation, do you think that God would do that to his son if you could come in these other ways? I think we'd have to say God would be infinitely cruel, at least to his son, to make his son suffer for nothing if he was willing to let people come any other way. See, God would only do this, the Father would only do this if there was no other way. Jesus is the only way that you can be saved, which is why if you would be saved, you must turn from your sins and trust in him alone. To say that there is any other way of salvation is to do tremendous dishonor to God who poured out his wrath on his son in order to save. Jesus is the only way. So Jesus did have to die in order for salvation to be possible, in order for you to be saved, in order for me, in order for that possibility, that offer to be given to the world. But now let's ask the second question. Why is it that it had to be Jesus that would go through this suffering? Well, because the answer is, of course, he is the only one who could have saved us. He is the only one who could go through it, and he's the only one who could actually save us by going through it. Now, again, Jesus looked to his Father in prayer as the one who was able to do all things, and he asked if it's possible, again, if there's some other way, that the cup might pass, but it wasn't possible. And the reason why it wasn't possible was because Jesus is the only one who could drink this cup. And he had to drink it in order to make it possible for the Father to forgive, as well as, of course, to save those whom the Father wanted to save. This was the only way. Now, why was Jesus the only one who could do this? And there's really two reasons why. The first one is because he is the only one who is qualified to do it. And the second one is that he's the only one who could have survived doing this. First of all, he's the only one who was qualified to drink the cup. Let's not forget who it is that, was, that had sinned against the Lord. And that is us. Okay, we were the ones who owed the debt. We were the ones liable to pay the debt. The debt had to be exacted from us if God is to be just. Well, you know, Jesus became one with us. He became a man so that he could take upon himself that debt and pay it in our place. But you realize, secondly, that the debt was such a great debt. It was an infinitely great debt that we owed the Lord because we had sinned against an infinitely holy God that only God could pay this debt. There's no way that man could pay it. I mean, when man pays the debt, he never pays it off. That's why those who die in their sins with their guilt still clinging to them go into a fiery hell, go into an oven of God's wrath, and they never come out because they can never satisfy it. If a payment is going to be made, a payment in full, the only one who could make it is one who is infinitely worthy. And so one who is infinitely worthy did come down to pay this debt. 
Jesus is God as well as man. He is the second person of the triune God. He had to become a man to pay it on behalf of man, but he had to be God so that he could make a payment on the cross that was enough to pay the debt. But sometimes we don't consider the second reason why it had to be Jesus Christ, and that is because of what he must endure on the cross. Again, the sight of which made Jesus sweat blood, and that is God's wrath. Jesus is the only one who could possibly survive making this payment. Any mere man would surely have been destroyed once God turned his full wrath on him. Now, the only reason why Jesus survived was, again, because he is God as well as man. I'm not saying his humanity is God as well as man, but I'm saying that his divinity, as it were, held up his human nature under that suffering so that he could endure it. He was able to make the payment because he was a man, but he was able to survive making the payment because he is God. The fact of which not only gives infinite value to his sacrifice, but again, kept his human nature from being destroyed. And again, it brings us back to that same point. Jesus had to die. There was no other way that salvation could come. He was the only one who could make the payment on our behalf if we were to be saved. He was the only one who could survive making the payment if we were to be saved. And really one other reason why it had to be Jesus Christ is because the glory for this work had to be given to God. He won't share his glory with anyone else. And so the one who would come into the world to save us had to be God so that he might receive the glory and honor for this work as well. But the point of all of this, again, is simply this. If you want to be safe, if you don't want to face, the, as it were, God's wrath, that, that furnace of fire, which uh, I don't know if you've, if you've had the opportunity to read Dante's Inferno, but I would say that even what he describes there is nothing compared to what hell is like. There is one level in, in uh, uh, hell that may be similar and that is a place where this lid is opened and there are all these damned souls in there in this fire and they're being burned in this fire. Uh, that may come close, but it's much worse than we can possibly imagine. That is what you and I deserved. And that's what you and I would have received if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ. But if you haven't received Jesus Christ, that's still what you're looking forward to, whether you realize it or not. That is what you are going to get when you die, you will be cast into the furnace of fire. And certainly when you are removed for that brief period of time on the day of judgment and judged for your sins, you will go back then into a lake of fire where you will burn forever. That is what the Lord says is the penalty for our sins against Him. So if that's not what you want, if you want to be safe, if you want to be saved from that, there is only one way. And that is through Jesus Christ. You need to come to him. You need his sacrifice. It's the only sacrifice that's been given that God will actually accept. He will accept no other way. There are not many paths that lead to God. There is only one. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His sacrifice, his perfect obedience, his mediation his prayers, his standing between God and man, he is the only bridge, as it were, the only path, the only door that we can go to God. And so if you have not trusted Jesus Christ, you do need to realize that that is the only way of salvation. And if you do not take that only path, then you may die and go to hell. You will die someday. Hopefully, by God's grace, you will not die in your sins realize Jesus offers himself to you as a savior and he is willing to receive anyone who comes to him. Now let me just say this in closing because there is a point in here that applies to us aside from this and, and one thing that I'm always a bit concerned about is, is the idea that we, we believe that if we understand these things and you know, we've heard them, we understand them, we even believe that they're true. 
and we, we perhaps have believed that we've looked to Jesus Christ and, and have trusted him, uh, that that somehow is enough without our lives actually being changed. You know, I hope you agree with me that if we are genuinely Christians, our life will be transformed. We will begin to reflect the, the nature of Jesus Christ because his spirit lives in us. And the Spirit gives us love for the same things that, that Jesus loves. There, there has to be a change. So I always want to ask this question, although perhaps lately I haven't been asking it as much as I have in the past. How can we know that we really have savingly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and that we've, we've actually gone beyond what the devils, as it were, uh, all experience as well? By the way, you know, every demon knows what Jesus did. Every demon believes that Jesus is who he said he, he is, and, and that the way of salvation is only through Jesus Christ. But they don't come to Jesus Christ. They haven't trusted Jesus Christ, and their lives haven't been transformed by Jesus Christ. They, they see all these things, and they believe them, and it affects the way they live even. They tremble, and they know that they're under his sovereign control, but they are not saved. They don't love him. They don't do his will. So how can you know that your faith has gone beyond that? Well, again, realizing what the end of salvation is, which is not, as many would say today, simply to save you from hell, that, that is part of it, the big part of it. And we're very thankful for that. But that's not all it is. It's also to save you from the power of sin, to set you free from sin, so that you would begin to do what Jesus would do if he were living in your place. And I think that that's a very obvious way that you can know whether you have savingly believed. Not that you're perfect, but that your heart is moving you in that direction that you are willing to do whatever the Lord calls you to do. Now, Jesus did say that if you want to be his disciple, that you have to pick up your cross, you have to follow him, and that means dying to yourself to do his will. In other words, you need to do what Jesus did when he was in the garden, when he was faced with a choice. And there was a real choice there. We already saw that. There's a cup that was being handed to him by the Father, and inside the cup was the wrath of the Father. And the question is, are you going to drink this or not? Well, Jesus, he prayed and he sweat blood as he thought about the, the, you know, the implications of, of drinking that, of, of going the path the Father was calling him, and it was a struggle, and he prayed for grace to do it, but there was still a choice there, and he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass. I mean, he was a human being, and he experienced what we would experience if we were in that same situation, only he did so without sin. He wanted to preserve his life. He didn't want to go through suffering. Nobody wants to go through suffering. But of course, understanding what it was going to bring, he was willing to do that. But the question is, when you're faced with choices like that, where you know what God wants you to do, this is the path I know he wants me to take, but this is the more comfortable path. If I don't do this, I can take this path, I can kind of slink away from this and not really have to face the difficulty that I know the Lord is calling me to face. The question is, are you willing to do what the Lord calls you to do? Are you willing to take what it is the Father hands to you when you see clearly the path he's calling you to walk? You know the one that he tells you in his word, this is my will, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, to stand for the truth here. I want you to bear witness of me. I want you not to join in with these others and all these dirty jokes and act like one of the, of the gang. I want you to be light and I want you to be salt, even if it means you're going to be hated by the world. You know, are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to do what Jesus did in the garden? that willingness, not just to feel like I want to do it, but then do something else all the time, but that actual doing of those things, that is the evidence that the Lord has actually transformed your life when you can say, not my will, but your will be done. That's how you can know that you belong to the Lord when you will do what he wants you to do rather than what you want to do and then even more than that, when what you want to do becomes actually what it is he tells you he wants you to do. You see, our heart needs to be wrapped up in the Lord, and that is the evidence that it is when we can do this the way our Lord Jesus did. So if that is what is in your heart, then you can know that Jesus lives in you, I mean literally, by his Spirit, and that he is transforming you. 
That is the evidence that you are safe from the fiery oven of his wrath. But if that isn't in you, then you still need to trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins and follow him. Well, may the Lord give to each of us here this morning the grace to be able to make that choice for him to trust Jesus, to turn from our sins, and to see this evidence in our lives that we might find serving him and serving one another to be even more pleasurable than simply serving ourselves. The Lord did not put us into the world to serve ourselves. That is the essence of sin. He put us into the world to serve him and to serve others. And again, the evidence that we are his is that when we take pleasure in doing that, when that is our pleasure and our delight, then we can know that he has worked that work of grace. It's not going to be perfect by any means, and we're going to struggle a great deal, but it does have to be there. May the Lord grant by his grace that it might be in all of our lives. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and apply it to our lives.